When a newlywed family finds out that they're expecting twins, they quickly try and find a new home that will fit their growing needs. They find a deal that seems straight out of a dream, but instead end up purchasing a nightmare. As the years wear on, they begin to experience numerous unexplained phenomena, happenings that lead them to believe that they're fighting a spiritual war for their very souls, a war against the devil himself. This is the untold story of the terrifying demon house of Enfield, Connecticut. And this is yet another story you won't want to watch in the dark. For today's content, I'm partnering with DraftKings yet again. Looking for an easy way to have some fun without leaving your house? Check out DraftKings Casino, the number one ranked online casino app with over 300 real money games. I'm partnering with DraftKings on this video to let you guys know about an awesome deal they have going on right now. All new customers who sign up using promo code MYSTERYARCHIVES and make a minimum $5 deposit will get that deposit matched dollar for dollar up to $100 in casino credits. You heard right, DraftKings is matching all new customers' deposits dollar for dollar up to $100 in casino credits when they sign up using promo code MYSTERYARCHIVES. With over 175 slot games for you to choose from, including your favorites, and an assortment of DraftKings exclusives, there are so many ways to have fun. If Casino isn't yet available in your state, check out DraftKings Daily Fantasy app, where you can win cash prizes all season long. Most importantly, DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. That's all new customers who sign up using promo code Mystery Archives and make a $5 minimum deposit will get that deposit matched dollar for dollar up to $100 in casino credits. Now, let's get back to the content. In spring of 2005, in Connecticut, Jay and Elka Yapel, a young newlywed couple, are greeted with the news that they've been hoping for. They find out that they're pregnant, but instead of just one child blessing their lives, they find out that they're expecting twins. Quite the task for first-time parents to tackle, but the couple are excited and eager to take the situation head-on and embrace their babies as soon as they arrive. Part of tackling this situation is finding a new home to live and grow in. They know their current home just will not accommodate them in the future. So, hoping to fix this as soon as possible, before their children arrive into the world, the couple sets off with a limited budget to see what they can find in the local housing market. At first, it seems that perhaps their efforts are in vain, that they were potentially priced out of the market, but not wanting to accept this, they continue searching day in and day out. One afternoon, a miracle seems to fall right into their eager laps. In a town known as Enfield, they come across an old home for sale. Although the house is 200 years old, and will require some work over time. The current condition is acceptable, and the size seems to be everything they need and are looking for. Jay's first impression of the house was that he could see it as the start of a very good life for him and his new family. He sees a safe and solid place for his children to grow and play. His wife, however, got a very different impression. Upon stepping inside the house for the first time, she felt an uneasy, almost menacing feeling like she did not want to live there, let alone raise her children there. Jay, however, sees the opposite in the home and thinks it's a really good deal. Perhaps a deal that indeed was too good to be true. After several minutes of discussion against her better judgment, Elka reluctantly agrees with her husband, and the two decide to purchase the aging home. In the weeks to come, they would move in, and would be accompanied 
by their two Yorkie dogs. Starting to settle in, the couple begin to make the house a home. However, their dogs felt very different about their new living arrangement. Not very vocal animals previously, the two dogs seemed to go from their normal playful selves to something totally different. Instead, they now began to act skittish and jumpy and would aggressively bark at things that simply weren't there. Although the couple found this particularly odd, they simply chalked it up to a new environment and hoped that things would settle down as the two slowly got used to the house. However, as we'll see, this will not be the case. Just several months into living in the Enfield house, the Apel family begins to experience things that they can't explain. One afternoon, Elka opens the front door to head out of the house to run some errands. Taking in the fresh air, by this point she is fairly far along. She's seven months pregnant. She closes the door behind her and begins to descend the stairs. She takes one step, two steps, and out of nowhere, she feels someone or something push her from behind. As she loses her balance, she feels the same force grab both of her hands. She falls down the rest of the steps and lands hand stretched out directly onto her stomach. Yelling from the pain and fear that her babies have been harmed, Elka screams as she lays on the concrete. Inside the house, Jay is startled as he hears the screams of his pregnant wife, and upon rushing and discovering her, the two together begin to panic. Jay very quickly helps his wife up, and the two immediately rush to the closest hospital. When they arrive, Elka undergoes emergency testing, and thankfully, her babies are okay. However, both her and Jay have a terrible feeling brewing within them, although they can't place a finger on exactly what it is. As a result of her fall, Elka is placed on bed rest by her doctor for the remainder of her pregnancy. This development would mean that she would inevitably end up spending most of her remaining days alone and in the house. One day, Elka is laying in the bed upstairs with her two dogs, and although she is fairly settled, the dogs are not. The two are extremely restless and are moving up and down constantly and barking into the doorway and corner of the room. Not paying much attention at first, Elka continues to try and relax. But as she tunes out the animals, she can't tune out what she begins to hear. Out of nowhere, she begins to hear noise coming from the main level of the house below. The sounds of banging and creaking of the old wooden floorboards. Thinking this is Jay finally home from work, she tells the dogs to settle down because it's their dad. And she then calls out to Jay asking him to answer her back. She called out, Jay, if that's you, I need you to tell me. But after the sound of several more footsteps, she is met with nothing but icy silence in return. Suddenly, her dogs go ballistic. In the hallway, before her very eyes, she sees what appears to be a black dog. But not just any black dog an ominous black dog who's massive and it's gnashing its teeth and it is slowly heading towards her. Frozen with fear, Elka is unable to catch her breath at the sight of it. Her dogs are now cowering next to her. When she does manage to catch her breath, she stands up and prepares to defend herself as best as she can. The hound, still staring her down, starts to slowly back up and then it rounds the corner headed towards the stairs. Slowly creeping towards where she last saw the creature, Elka works up the courage to look over the corner, but as she does, she is startled yet again. 
this hound, this creature, has vanished. She is baffled and left without an explanation as to what had just happened. Several hours later, her husband Jay would finally return home from work. Upon relaying what had happened to him, Jay dismissed his wife, thinking that she had been dreaming or that her hormones must be playing a part in what she had seen. Elka, instead, is left scared, wandering, and questioning her sanity. To make his wife feel better, Jay did end up sweeping the house, but didn't find any trace of this hellhound that his wife had described. So together, they both decided just to stop talking about it and let the whole event go. For the rest of the pregnancy, things within the Yaples' home are quiet. There are no more paranormal happenings. Just two months later, their twins, Mackenzie and Courtney, were born. This was truly a happy and life-altering moment for them. Their long wait had finally come to an end, and in its place, the long journey of parenthood had just begun. Things for a time would continue to be calm within the home. In the months to come, the couple would adjust to being parents and would do everything they could to provide for and protect their girls. This included baby-proofing the house, placing baby monitors around, and constantly checking on them at all hours of the day and night. And within several more months, the young girls were already crawling. Elka would eventually go back to work, which required Jay and her to hire a babysitter. That was a woman named Michelle Ziegler, a preschool teacher with years of experience working with little ones. From the first day that she cared for the twins, as mom and dad were at work, the noises would begin. Michelle would describe the first day like this. As I cared for the girls and laid them down to nap and headed back downstairs, I was startled to hear what sounded like someone running up and down the stairs. Not sure of what to make of this, I ran upstairs only to find that nothing was out of place and that the girls were still fast asleep. It was bizarre. Another day while babysitting, Michelle was playing with the twins in the living room when suddenly, out of nowhere, she hears a massive banging sound that shakes the entire house. The sound's origin is above them. The girls would make their way towards the stairs and begin pointing towards the top of it. Getting anxious, Michelle runs up to them and looks at what they were calling attention to. Before her very eyes, she sees the dark figure of a dog, but this dog is massive in comparison to the Yaples Yorkies. As the two stare down, Michelle also hears the creature growl. As she slowly backs up at the bottom of the stairs with the girls behind her arms, it suddenly vanishes into thin air. It's important to note that Michelle was not spoken to about any prior experiences that Elka had been through. The young woman is scared half to death. The experience impacts her so much that once the Yaples come home from work that day, she informs them of what had taken place and that she had believed she had seen some kind of ghost. And lastly, that this would be the final week she would babysit for them. The Aples soon enough would find a new babysitter and would carry on living their lives. That was until one particular night. In the middle of the night, as everyone in the house is asleep, Elka is suddenly woken up by a loud banging noise coming through the baby monitor. Perplexed as to just what could have caused the noise, she goes to check on the girls both of which she finds, are fast asleep. Thinking it must have been the monitor picking up some sort of interference, she soon heads back to bed. As she starts to doze off yet again, 
she is woken up by a deep, demonic voice coming through the monitor. It said, you're all going to die. Elka sits up in disbelief, and the monitor says the same thing again, but louder. This time, both her and Jay hear it, and screaming for their children, Elka is the first to rush back to the girls' room, with Jay right behind her. As they run into the bedroom, thankfully they discover that both girls are safe and still sound asleep. Jay, although panicking internally, tries his best to stay calm while comforting his hysterical wife to be her person to lean on. This event in particular seemed to change Elka according to Jay and he would not be the only one who would notice. At work, Elka's supervisor, a woman named Shauna, would also notice a complete shift in her personality. In her words, she was not the bubbly and easygoing person I had met two years ago. She now was constantly on edge. As time would go on, Elka would continue to change and stopped almost all socializing. Overtaken by the paranormal events that now plagued her family's lives, she kept it all to herself for fear of ridicule that could come from others in discussing such a matter. Worried about his wife and in an effort to try and understand just why things could be occurring in his home, Jay would contact and become friends with a local Enfield historian, a woman named Colleen Heidi. Jay wanted to know who had built and lived in his home. So, with only the knowledge that the house was built in 1771, he went to the town hall where the records and deed histories were kept. Accompanied by Colleen, the two would be shocked by what they found. No home in all of Enfield history had as many disturbing deaths or tragedies as the Yaples' home did. The house had seen over 20 deaths in the past 200 years, 24 out of the 25 occupants to be exact. There had been falls, brain hemorrhages, carbon monoxide poisoning, complications from surgeries, a child vomiting and becoming aspirated, and one person who was burned on over 90% of their body. Other deaths resulted from pneumonia, and people unaliving themselves. These are two of the strangest cases I was able to track down and get details on. The first was that of Charles Comparato. In 1930, an Italian immigrant named Charles Comparato, who lived in the house, became infatuated with his neighbor. One evening, he got up from the table where he was eating dinner with his own family and grabbed a stiletto knife walked down the street, and while her and her husband were eating, Charles walked into their house and then stabbed her seven times, cut her husband's throat, and then walked back home. After getting back to his own house, he would then unalive himself, leaving his body's blood-stained image on the living room floor. The second was that of a woman named Elizabeth Arnett. She was a woman that had owned the house in 1919, but only for a short time. One evening, as she was heading out the front door, she fell or was pushed, leading to her breaking both of her arms and smashing her skull on the steps. She would breathe her last breath on the stairs, the very same stairs that Elka had been pushed down when she was pregnant with the twins. A similarity that was all too familiar to the Yables. Given all the darkness of the home's past, it truly seemed that something evil inhabited its walls. But despite believing that their home was indeed haunted, the Yables weren't in a position to sell their house. So for the time being, they tried to keep things in order to live the best way that they could. One night, as the moon hung above the Yable house, Elka was working this night, and the girls already in bed. Jay was watching some TV with the couple's dogs. 
an hour or so into watching, one of the Apel's Yorkies, named Gizmo, began to run towards the kitchen, as if someone had walked in. Within seconds, he began to bark, which further caught Jay's attention. As Jay got up and began to approach the kitchen where Gizmo was causing a ruckus, before his very eyes, he could see a black mass in the back corner of the kitchen. This is what Gizmo was barking at. Continuing to head towards his dog, but more cautiously, he then is shocked when Gizmo is thrown backwards towards him. Going from all fours to seeing his back arch up to him launching at him several feet. As if the small dog has been kicked and kicked very hard. Running towards the kitchen, Jay sees nothing. The apparition is gone. His poor dog is now gripped with fear and begs to be picked up, not wanting to leave his father's side. He curls up by his neck for the remainder of the night. When Elka gets home in the morning, Jay tells her what took place, and the two begin a deep discussion about what they thought was going on in the house. After talking about the history, how dark it was, and how vicious this force seemed to be, the couple comes to the conclusion that whatever it is, is certainly paranormal. And this paranormal force was malevolent. It seemed to hate anything that was alive. Fearing for themselves as well as their children and pets, the Yaples shortly after their discussion would contact a group called the Enfield Paranormal Society in hopes that perhaps they could help decipher what was going on and perhaps still could assist them in getting rid of whatever this thing was. They speak with the man who founded the society, Matt Kondraki, someone who was all too familiar with the spirit world and had investigated hundreds of cases all over the state of Connecticut. The Yaples agree to have Matt and his team conduct an investigation of their home, and shortly after their call, he would arrive, equipment in hand. This was his first impression in his own words. Upon arriving, the neighborhood seemed completely normal, but the minute you walked in the house and closed the door behind you, it became difficult to breathe. Like the air was heavy, an ominous, dark feeling overtook you, and I certainly would not want to live there. Over the course of the team's investigation, they began to ask the entity questions to try and make some sort of contact. They started upstairs. When asking, why are you trying to hurt this family, they would receive the following EVP, or electronic voice phenomenon. <sighs> to them, it sounded like an angry or territorial dog that was barking, as if to warn someone not to take another step towards them or their turf. Shortly after this recording, the room began to heat up, the temperature would read close to a hundred degrees. Worried that this creature was going to manifest for a physical attack, Matt and his crew rushed downstairs and into the kitchen in hopes of avoiding this, as well as cooling down. Meanwhile, as they visit with the Yaples, their children are upstairs, sound asleep in their room. Roughly twenty minutes into talking in the kitchen, everyone hears a massive boom above them as if a huge object has crashed into the house. The first to run up the stairs is Elka, with Matt close behind her, heading up to the baby's room. As they throw the door open to check on the girls, they see blood all over the room, on their cribs, their mobile, and the walls and the floor. A large lamp that was in the corner of the room was upside down on the floor and its light bulb was shattered. Jay and Elka examined their children for any sort of injury that could have been caused, but mysteriously, they find nothing, not a single cut or scratch whatsoever. But where did this blood come from? The couple defaults to searching the entire home with the team for signs of an intruder, but after half an hour of clearing the home, there is no evidence of a break-in and no one to be found. After this, Matt, his team, 
and the Yaples would speak again in their kitchen about what they thought was taking place, and Matt was honest with them. He believed that what they were dealing with was a non-human spirit, a demon, a creature that has never walked the earth, one that has never lived in our plane of existence, and that this demon was manifesting as this black dog. He was also fairly certain that whatever it was did not want the family there, and despite all of his experiences up until this point, he had never dealt with something like this so he wouldn't be able to assist them further. After the paranormal team leaves for the night, Jay and Elka clean up the mystery blood in their children's room, and then discuss what their next moves will be. They consider trying to sell the house, but Jay felt obligated to disclose to any potential buyer the history and experiences in the house, and truly didn't want anyone living there, especially someone who had kids or pets, or both. But with this, he deep down was in fear of what this thing was and just what it wanted to do to him and his family. So ultimately, not seeing another option, the Yaples would make contact with another paranormal group in the area, one that specializes in dealing with demonic hauntings. This group was Connecticut Paranormal, and the man they spoke with was named Bob Baker. His impression of Jay was that he seemed truthful and consistent, something he looked for in order to weed out any particular pranksters. Because when someone is making things up, their stories tend to change over time, and Jay's didn't change then, and it hasn't changed now. The three would arrange for an investigation to take place in the next week. When they arrive... Upon crossing the threshold of the centuries-old house, Bob Baker immediately knew that this force was sinister, and that they would need a priest if they were to make any headway in freeing the family from this hellish prison. He immediately calls one, a man named Bob Bailey, a priest who has helped his group and others with demonic hauntings for many years. Bob deemed this case severe due to believing it was a demonic haunting, and with having a demon in the house, it was especially a threat to the children. Upon receiving permission from the church, Father Bailey arrives within hours of the call. In his own words, From the moment I walked in, I could tell that the air was thick with oppression. And with the priest's arrival, the investigation began. First, Bob Baker began to inquire if there was anything non-human or demonic in the house and commanded it show itself since it now had no place to hide. With these series of questions, the tool they had brought to measure the EMF or electronic magnetic field began to shoot up into the red. This is believed to be indicative of a high level of spiritual activity. After this took place, they began to try and make contact with anyone who had passed within the house, seeking to speak with any lost souls that could potentially be trapped inside. During this EVP session, they did not receive any answers to their questions. However, the EMF reader was again fully in the red. The team decided to call in an additional asset to assist them, a spiritual medium by the name of Paula O'Brien. Paula had years of experience dealing specifically with demonic hauntings as well. When she arrives, she begins to provoke the entity. From the moment she stepped into the house, she could sense that there was something nasty there. As she attempts to make contact, the crew begins to head upstairs. It's here on the second level that they felt the oppressive feeling to be the strongest. Paula believed that the entity was hiding there. As they wander into the girls' room to continue to ask the entity just what it was, they catch an orb on their footage. The orb then traveled from the closet and out into the hallway and then made its way towards the Yaple's dog, Mandy. Mandy then began to have a coughing fit that would turn into convulsions. 
The father believed that the demon was attacking the animal in an effort to distract them from trying to figure out its motive. Mandy wasn't just a beloved pet. She had moved with Elka from Germany and had been her parents' dog. Both of her parents were gone now, so Mandy was like the last living link to her past. Perhaps the demon sensed this and attacked her for this reason. As Mandy suffered, they quickly picked her up and rushed her down to the main level of the home. From here, they laid her on the floor and began to pray over her. Thankfully, within about 15 minutes, little Mandy would sit her head up and begin to walk normal once again. Both Father Haley and Paula no longer sensed the entity. Relieved that their dog was okay and that the entity had either been severely weakened or had gone totally, the Yaples thanked everyone there for their incredible work. As they packed up and prepared to leave, the crew warned them, however, that if the entity had just been weakened, that it would indeed come back stronger than before and with a vengeance and that every drop of fear they felt would fuel the demon's return. So, as a precaution, they agreed to return in two weeks. Just several days after the initial assistance from the Connecticut Paranormal Society, Elka was again working the night shift, leaving Jay by himself with the girls and dogs. Jay lays his girls down to bed for the night, while him, Gizmo, and Mandy lay together to relax and watch TV in the living room. As he flicks through the channels, trying to find something entertaining to watch, he suddenly hears what sounds like a large animal running up and down the stairs. This disturbs both him and the dogs, and the three bolt up and head towards the stairs to see just what it could be. As they approach the bottom of the stairs, Gizmo and Mandy began barking with such ferociousness as if they were fending something off with their very lives. There, at the top of the stairs, was once again an apparition, but this time, it was much more terrifying. Before Jay's very eyes, he sees a creature with pale skin, bat-like wings, and glistening fangs. It keeps lurching at them menacingly from the top of the stairs. Standing his ground, Although petrified with fear, Jay is much more worried about his kids. He begins to get closer to the stairs, not yielding any ground to the demon. It snarls, fangs out, but as he climbs the stairs, it slowly begins to back up, and then it dissipates, completely, just as the hellhound had previously, but were the creatures one and the same. Jay then runs upstairs to his girl's room and takes them down into the living room with him. He will not even think about sleep until his wife is back at home. Bob Baker, his team with Connecticut Paranormal, alongside Paula the Medium, and Father Bailey return to assist the Yaples family. Having felt like they exhausted all other efforts, the family, team, and priest all decide that it was time for spiritual warfare. As Father Bailey presented a crucifix embedded with an exorcised medal of St. Benedict, the demon quickly began to show them all its deep displeasure. As he prayed within the girl's room and commanded the entity to show itself, the crew suddenly captured this EVP, a demonic whisper of sorts, saying, Get out. Despite this, Father Bailey continued his cleansing of the home, moving from room to room, binding and commanding the spirits in the name of Jesus to go back from whence it had came. Paula believed the entity no longer having a place to hide, fled down to the one place that had yet to be cleansed, the basement. Upon descending the stairs, the father thought to himself, this is a perfect place for evil to hide. As he resumed his cleansing, 
everyone slowly began to make their way towards the back of the basement. And at the end of the basement, on that back wall, the section of the wall has been removed. And when lighting the space, everyone witnesses a large black mass float into this cracked section of the wall. It was here that Paula and Father Bailey felt the most oppressive energy they had ever experienced. A feeling of emptiness. A desolate crypt, far away from God. They believed that this is where the demon resided. Having discovered its hiding place, they restart their efforts to finish the cleansing of the home. And during this process, multiple people become violently ill. A sign that the demon, once cornered, was fighting with every possible weapon it had. And it seemed like it wasn't going to leave, no matter how hard the priest commanded it to. But finally, after several tense hours, Father Bailey and Paula finally feel the heavy pressure of the demon's presence vanish. In the months following the cleansing, the Yaples would continue to have several paranormal experiences, but Bob Baker had informed them that as if their home was a living body and the cancer of the demon had been removed, that it was in the process of healing in a sense, and that the residuals should eventually go away. I tried my best to get a current update on the Yapel family, but the most recent update I found was from October of 2015. As of that date, the Yapels still owned and lived in the house, and were still experiencing multiple things not of this world. Alongside that, I tried my best to find out just how this demon could have made its way into the home in the first place. And according to several articles, the children of Charles Comparado were believed to have dabbled with a Ouija board in the basement of the house. And when wallpaper was stripped back in certain areas, strange and occult drawings could be found. But did their meddling with the unknown conjure something that previously hadn't been there? Or with the prior tragic events, had the entity already been there? And perhaps all they did was pour fuel on the fire. It's hard to say. All of this, at the end of the day, is just speculation. But what do you think? Is this case legitimate? What would you have done if you encountered a hellhound or a vampiric looking creature? Let me know down in the comments below. And remember, if something seems too good to be true, it almost always is. And that gift that you've been hoping for, for your future, sometimes can be a Trojan horse for something desolate, dark, and evil. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're new here. And even if you're not new here, you can turn on notifications so you never miss a new upload. It's kind of strange to me that about 80% of you don't have them on, but it would help me out a ton if you did. I promise I won't spam you. I would also like to thank today's sponsor, DraftKings, for helping to support the channel and my work. And lastly, I've been dealing with some issues with my family that have kept me pretty preoccupied recently, especially this past month. And I feel like you guys deserve so much more than just two shorter uploads. I'm going to deliver some A-game quality content for all of you. And I hope that we all continue to have a great time headed towards fall and Halloween. So, as always guys, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Remember to stay safe out there. And take care.